Hello everyone, my name is Kelly O'Shaughnessy. I'm a dental hygienist and I am going to give you a brief presentation on oral health. What is it all about? So the aims and objectives for this presentation is to bring an awareness of oral health and links with general health, to educate you on free sugars, sugar frequency and snack ideas, to educate on oral hygiene age and techniques, to educate you the parent or caregiver of your children on dental issues affecting overall health and I'm going to finally give you a brief outline of gum disease risk factors and treatment. So just myself as a background, um, I've been in dentistry for about 25 years and I would have developed a program called the Dental Den program, which was aimed to improve the oral health of children and families, uh, focused very much on prevention and the holistic view. So bringing, um, thinking of the mouth as the gateway to the body, so bringing the whole of health into the oral health advice that we give. So when we think of tooth decay or dental caries, okay, we think of sugar. Um, and what's interesting about this is sugar doesn't only cause tooth decay, but it is also a main uh, major factor for um, childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes. So what does the World Health Organization say? Uh, well, the World Health Organization, or the WHO, recommends that we take no more than 5% of our food or drink a day should be sugar. This equates to about 6 teaspoons, or 30 grams a day. So when we think about um, dental uh, decay or dental caries, I don't know if you can see it there, the fifth uh, category down. Um, when, when someone comes to the dental practice and we're educating on ways to prevent dental decay, uh, we would educate on toothbrushing and we would also educate on diet. But by giving that dietary advice, um, we actually could have an impact on the patient's um, uh, risk of heart disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes linked with obesity. So this is what we know as we know as the common risk factor approach. So as oral health promoters within a dental setting, we aim to give advice that will help the whole of the body. So what are free sugars? Uh, free sugars are table sugars, including sugars added to food. And um, this makes up about 70% of sugars in our foods are hidden. So I, I can, don't know if you can see there the green board with demonstrations of different food types, sweets and treats that have sugar, different amounts of sugar in. Um, what's quite interesting is that some companies um, and food um, marketers can use um, names like natural, um, you know, can promote some foods as being healthy to a certain extreme. Um, you know, some people mix up what fat free is uh, and mix that with being sugar free. So there's a lot of very clever marketing that makes parents and caregivers, um, you know, believe that the, the food or drink is a good alternative. And sometimes it's not. And we will talk about reading sugar labels and how to ascertain that. So the different types of sugars, free sugars are the ones added to food and drinks. The other type of sugars are intrinsic sugars and these are sugars found inside the cell of a food or drink and this would be included in vegetables and fruits and the other, the other type of fluid would be milk sugars. Okay, so vegetables and shoes, fruits and milk sugars. However, when intrinsic sugars are broken down, they then become free sugars. Okay, and what I mean by that is if we, for example, have fruits, if these are modified in any way and turned into juices, smoothies or dried and made into raisins, for example, these then become a potential source of dental decay. Um, the other thing to consider with foods such as juices and smoothies is these are actually high uh, acid foods. Um, we can also find high acidic foods in a lot of fizzy drinks. Um, and other foods and drinks as listed there. So the issue around even some of our diet drinks or our sugar-free drinks still have a high acid. And what high acid does is it causes something in dentistry we call acid erosion. 
And what this means is that the enamel, the outer surface of the tooth, that's broken down by sugars um, and caused dental decay, can also be worn away by foods and drinks that are, have a high uh, acid content, um, which would be um, a low pH level. So what we say is that if you are intaking foods and drink um, that are of uh, high acid content, then please wait 30 minutes to brush your, your, your teeth afterwards. Because if you brush your teeth straight after eating these foods or drinks, then it can take, uh, the, the toothbrush can actually wear the enamel away. So it's hard to know which foods are high acidic on, or not. So as a rule, just to make, wait 30 minutes to brush after any food or drink. Now this can become a problem, um, you know, if for example, like our own house at home, I've two children and I find that, you know, sometimes getting them out in the morning, the last thing they're doing is taking a spoon of uh, breakfast or cereal as they leave the house. So what we do in our house is we've looked at that and uh, my son who sleeps upstairs brushes his teeth before he comes downstairs and that works better for him whereas my daughter likes to eat first and then potter around so each household will be different each individual will be different so find what works for you but make that a routine uh, for the individual These are some pictures then of some teeth that have been um, have got, have got at what we call acid erosion, okay, where the enamel is worn away. So when the enamel is worn away, the dentine, the surface underneath the enamel, shines through like a yellow. So this is the inside of the upper teeth, and these are some lower teeth there. Um, that can make the teeth very sensitive, um, but it can also make the teeth much more prone to decay. Okay, so this is a, a funny little slide, but basically, um, I suppose what we need to consider is that we are very um, aware of sugar um, in this day and age. We're aware of what it does to our bodies, which is a great thing. But previous generations maybe didn't have uh, the knowledge about sugar. So there would have been... Um, you know, before us, maybe it might be parents or grandparents or great grandparents that believed, you know, that, um, you know, start caller early in life, you know, as you see this advert, how soon is too soon? So there would have been a time where, um, you know, food companies uh, promoted sugar and we knew, you know, no different. However, interestingly enough, food companies are still, um, you know, very influential on young people and what we eat or drink. So it's still around us, uh, maybe not in such a frank uh, way, but it is around us. So if we take into consideration some of the fizzy drinks um, that use branding marketing where they put uh, people's names on the cartons or on the packet of uh, chocolate. Uh, so all that is to entice young people to buy their products. Um, so just to be aware that there is a strong influence around us and our previous generations uh, may not um, may need the little bit of guidance and help. So if you are a parent or caregiver, you know, um, educate your uh, parents, grandparents uh, on the changes that we now are aware of. OK, so I, with sugar, um, one thing is the sugar amount that's in our food. So we've told you earlier that the World Health Organization has said that no more than 5% um, of our intake should be sugar. So when we're looking at sugar labels, the easiest way to work this out um, is if we go to the, on the sugar label, the nutritional part that says oh, carbohydrates, there's a part then underneath that that says sugars, or sometimes it's written of which sugars, and it gives us an amount in grams. So if you have a calculator or a phone in the supermarket, these, you know, you can work it out, 4.2 grams is equal to one teaspoon. However, a very quick way, especially for kids that might be doing their five times table to help uh, and empower them to, to work out the maths as well, would be that five grams is equal to one teaspoon if we were to round it there. So if we look at 
this uh, product, for example, uh, we can see it says 24.6. So we might round that up to 25 grams. So quite easily then if we do our five times table, we can see that that's five teaspoons of sugar. And if our intake of sugar is six teaspoons a day, then we can see that we're quite very soon, uh, we're up at our maximum amount of sugar. The other thing to take into consideration is the ingredients. Um, so we can see there from so from the ingredients there, we can see that the list is giving us evaporated cane juice, a type of sugar, high fructose corn syrup, a type of sugar, and brown rice syrup, a type of sugar. So within the ingredients of a nutritional packet, whatever is listed first will be of a higher content. So if you if sugar is listed as one of the oses or um, one of the syrups or, or juices, then we know that this sugar, this content has a Oh, this food product has a high content of sugar. And another thing to consider is often when we look at some of our favorite cereal packets, um, it will give us, for example, a 30 gram serve, serving. So um, a 30 gram serving, you know, is equal for this example here, three teaspoons of sugar. However, in this bowl that's in front of us, we actually have two servings. So that actually brings us to a 60 gram serving. And if you ever actually got a weighing scales at home and, and again, get the kids to do this, get a weighing scales, pop the ball on the weighing scales and press zero and put in your 30 grams of cereal, you will see you'll get half of this amount, half of a ball. So in most cases, a lot of our, of our us as well, when we pour our own bowl of cereal, uh, we're pouring double the amount of the typical serving, recommended serving. So that brings us up to six teaspoons and, uh, if um, if they're anything like my kids when they get Cocoa Pops at their nanny's house in the summer, um, they go back when there's that milk at the bottom and top up another 30 grams. So for breakfast alone, they could be having nine teaspoons of sugar. So we just need to take that into consideration when we're reading the labels that the serving, recommended serving amount isn't always what we treat ourselves with. OK, it's like if you look on the packet of some of these favorite jelly brands, you know, it'll say recommended serving is four teaspoons of sugar and that might equate to just four jellies, not the whole packet of sweets. The bigger picture in relation to sugar is sugar frequency. So in part two of the recording, we're going to look at sugar frequency and explain what this is all about. So we're just going to start part two of uh, oral health. What's it all about? And we are going to start with sugar frequency. So we talked about sugar quantity and now we're going to talk about sugar frequency. So sugar itself has an addictive um, element to it. So basically the more sugar you eat, the more you like it, the more you crave it, the more addictive properties it have. It can cause um, on your body a spike in blood sugar. Uh, which leads to a uh, rush in energy and then um, a big slump. So you get this big uh, sugar drop afterwards, uh, which actually leads to becoming more, more hungry and craving more sugar. So it's this perpetual cycle of sugar addiction. In dentistry, when we think about sugar and the frequency of sugar, it does something um, to the mouth in terms of that it actually causes the acid attack that causes dental decay, which we talked about earlier. So the pH level in the mouth drops to a critical level below 5.5. So normal plaque uh, or oral pH is seven. And when you eat sugar, you get this instant drop to 5.5. Now for our mouth to get back to the normal pH of seven, this can take anything from 20 minutes to two hours. So as a rule, it takes roughly about an hour for our mouth to get back to normal. And what happens then when we constantly snack on sugary things, so it might just be that one jelly sweet and we might be popping it into our mouth every half an hour, then we keep causing this drop and drop and drop. And it means our mouth never gets the chance to be go back to normal if you like or get a break. So frequent snacking between meals is actually uh, what puts it as a, uh, us at a high risk or our children at a high risk as well of uh, dental decay. 
So what can we snack on? Well, to a certain degree, some some foods, um, you know, the 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 white bread and uh, the sugary food. Um, what we would go for alternatively would be um, natural foods or whole grain foods. So whole grain foods, fruits, um, fresh fruits in its whole form, as we described before, low sugar cereals such as Weetabix, porridge, cheese, whole grain, bread or toast. Um, so these are just some ideas for snacking if we need to snack in between meals. But the best thing to do is try and give the mouth a break and be aware, as we said before in part one, about fresh fruit being changed into juices or smoothies or from its natural form. Also be aware of some of our children might be to have to take medicine from time to time uh, from the doctor and always ask the doctor and pharmacist to prescribe a sugar free medicine. So dental plaque brushing and the bits in between. So one thing we can do and it's quite a fun activity to do with our children is do something we call plaque disclosing. Um, these are little tablets that can be bought in the pharmacy or the chemist. They're not tablets that you swallow, they're just food dye actually that you chew up, uh, swish around the mouth, there'll be full instructions on the packet and what happens is the, the food dye will stick to any plaque that's in the mouth. So it's, it's good to do it maybe after brushing, disclose the mouth, have a look in the mirror, let the child and even do it yourself alongside with them see the pink bits on the teeth and then uh, that this will help to see the plaque before you brush it off the second time what is important is that we use the right size toothbrush brush and that the toothbrush head is quite small and soft and of a good quality so the size of the brush needs to be that the child can fit the toothbrush up along the side of the gum to where the tooth meets the gum itself. And you can see by the picture here that the toothbrush is at an angle of 45 degrees onto the gum. And then it's a small circular movement uh, around. So we, we small movement around and brushing each and every tooth all the way around the outside and all the way around the inside upper and lower and then the biting surface. The other thing that can be used is different modifications. So if your child has any um, physical need where they might find it hard to hold a toothbrush, um, by all means, you can buy devices or you can make up your own. So here we can see there's an insulating tube or there's some rubber band wrapped around or these are the pencil grips that help with handwriting. So there is other um, aids out there that can help. The electric brush would be another um, aid that may help. So whatever you decide to try, make sure you visit your dentist or dental hygienist to get a one-to-one -one tailored instruction in the mouth for your child or for yourself if you're brushing your child's teeth. So you might say, when do we need to brush our child's teeth up to? Well, actually, you know, every individual is different to de their dexterity. You know, some children, even into teenage and adulthood, have difficulties with dexterity and that might be um, why they may need an electric brush and that's where your dentist or dental hygienist will advise. However, just a general room of thumb for most children until they can do joined up handwriting, um, they actually don't have the manual dexterity to do them small circles where the tooth meets the gum. What I would say is let them have a try themselves, but just follow up, uh, uh, you know, even if it's the evening time, if that's when you have more time in the day, that's actually the most important brush, the brush before bed, and just get them, get, uh, get them to let you either guide them or brush yourself and make sure that they have reached all the areas along the gum and the biting surface. In terms of toothpaste, we as dental healthcare providers would advocate for a fluoride toothpaste. Uh, with children under seven, the general rule is because we have fluoride in our public water supply, if you have the public water supply, it's a thousand parts per million of fluoride. This is written on the packaging, as you can see in this photograph here. Um, over seven would be the adult dose, which is 1,450. However, if your child is at high risk of dental decay or you're not on the public water supply of fluoride, your dentist or hygienist may recommend that you use the adult dose from a young age. 
Children under two do not use any toothpaste and that's just because they don't have the ability to spit it out. So it's from age two and you can see by the picture there a pea sized amount. After you've brushed or after the child has brushed as well, we spit but we don't rinse. So what we don't want to do is rinse with a tumbler of water afterwards because essentially what we're doing is rinsing all the toothpaste off. So it should be spit, spat out of the mouth that there's not a residue, um, but there shouldn't actually be no need to rinse after brushing. If your dentist or dental hygienist does recommend a fluoride mouthwash, OK, um, just to be aware that there is different levels of fluoride in mouthwash. So speak to your healthcare provider about what the measure you should be taking. For children's mouthwash, it's normally this amount here, which is 224 parts per million. So you'll notice it's much less than the toothpaste. So um, what we normally advise patients is that they use the fluoride rinse, should they need it prescriptively wise, should we advise it um, at a separate time of day to get the benefit out of it. However, this would be guided by advice from your dentist or hygienist. You know, not all children like having their toothbrush, so there is a variation of techniques. You can see one picture here where the toddler is, is actually lying down between the caregiver's legs um, and sometimes another thing that children may complain on is um, I know when my boy was younger, he would say that the toothpaste was very spicy. So it turned out he has sensory need and wouldn't like the taste of toothpaste. So you can get toothpaste that's unflavoured or has a mild flavour. So talk to your chemist or healthcare provider about them brands. So this is just a picture of an example of disclosing tablets. Uh, so brush teeth first, chew up the disclosing tablet, use the saliva that's naturally occurring in the mouth to swish around what becomes then a paste for two minutes, spit but don't rinse. And then the areas of plaque may be stained um, pink. Uh, sometimes you get these two-tone ones that are red or blue or pink and blue, purple colour. So um, the blue is older plaque and the red is new plaque. But either way, the teeth will be stained and then we can see what we're brushing off. Um, the thing about sweets and treats uh, is that we as a, I think as a, um, a nation, we reward not only children but ourselves sometimes with um, sweets or sugar as, as, a, as a, a reward or a tweet, treat. So, um, you know, for birthday parties, for, um, you know, any gatherings that we might have, celebrations, try and think of for example, the top picture here shows a party bag where we've put um, gone to the Euro shop and bought um, some balloons and a couple of rubbers and pencils and rulers. Um, this lower picture here is a yearly uh, trick or treat, uh, Halloween. Um, so I started this with my kids when we were younger, they were younger um, because they wanted to take part in trick or treat. Of course, they did. All their friends were doing it. So they still went out. They got to pick what sweets they wanted. And I tried to encourage them to pick the chocolate rather than the sticky sweets like the lollies, as you can see there. Um, and um, then we did the switch switch. So what we did was we offered a sum of money. Now, I think that's a two euro coin. It went up very quickly to five euro, let me tell you, and then 10 euro, I think one of the recent years. So um, it's gone up in price as they've got older, but we have, we do swap out them drumsticks, them sticky lollies, uh, anything that gets stuck in the teeth and they keep the other stuff and get a few pennies as well for uh, pocket money. OK, so the last thing I just want to touch on in part two is just a little bit about gum disease. OK, so obviously we're talking about plaque building on the teeth. So the other thing, if plaque isn't brushed off, um, that, you know, children and into teenage and, and adulthood can actually get gum disease. The one thing with gum disease is it's most diseases have, in our body have some sort of pain to alert us to the fact that something is uh, wrong. But with gum disease, we don't get that sign of pain. And it can start as young as, um, you know, childhood and adolescence. So this is the time to get the habits good with the brushing. So with gum disease, um, what can happen is if the plaque, the naturally occurring sticky plaque that, that we're brushing off every day gets stuck in along the gum, it can make its way underneath the gum and over time, and again, this might be something more into adolescence if you've older children or into early adulthood, um, it can start to break down bone. But it 
can start uh, in an inflammatory way, in an inflammation way at a younger age, okay? So this brings us back to the disclosing, a great aid, but also in this picture, as well as the disclosing agent, it was just to show you that, that some two-tone um, tablets that have that older plaque, you can see it's much thicker in density and also the gum is much red. So keep an eye out for that redness along the gum. Gum should be a lovely pale pink colour and gums should not bleed when you brush them. If gums are bleeding when you're brushing them, then that's a sign that they're inflamed, that there's probably been plaque left there maybe the day or week before and they're in an inflammatory state so um, not to be afraid of brushing them um, it, it shouldn't be that you're scrubbing or traumatizing the gum but if they're red like this there's a very much the chance that the plaque has actually caused this inflammation so take a visit to the dentist or hygienist to get this checked um, the other thing that you can have done by your dentist or hygienist if there is signs of gum disease is have the teeth cleaned, okay? This can be a cleaning above the gum or underneath the gum along the root. So really at the, prevent, at the heart of dental care is prevention. So our general advice is brushing twice a day. Um, as the children become older and their dexterity becomes better, we can start to clean in between the teeth. And I just want to finish by saying uh, parents are superheroes. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, I can be contacted at the email below and the very best of luck in the future healthcare and uh, oral care of yourself and your children. Thank you.